Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Folks, this morning I've got a simple uh, message, but one I believe uh, is for uh, someone, maybe just one, maybe some more people here this morning. Um, you know, it always amazes me um, in a sermon you can prepare, and I never think of particular people in mind. But after a sermon, there's various people who always speak to you sometimes on the day, sometimes you get a message through a week afterwards. And it always amazes me that you can give one sermon for anywhere between 45 minutes and three hours, we'll be clipping them, and, <laughs> uh, and uh, people can get the 59 different things from it. It's absolutely amazing. That really is the power of God working through um, His Word. But today we've got a simple message, um, and we're going to speak today on looking to the future, looking to the future and not living in the past. I believe God wants to release people today from the clutches, the bondage uh, of the past, and uh, things that have held perhaps you back. Uh, from moving on uh, in life uh, just now. Uh, I was commuting home from work a few weeks ago, and uh, if I'm being perfectly honest, I was feeling a bit sleepy, and I wanted to just have a snooze. I, I had worked my way for the last two hours of the day, I worked my way towards just, just get to that train, Stuart. As soon as you get to that train, you can sit down, you can collapse in a heap, set alarms, so you don't miss your station, <coughs> and you can just have a snooze. And I sat down, immediately as I sat down, the Lord said, Don't towards that. I said, Good Lord. I want to snooze. <laughs> yeah, and then he says, but it's not about you. Right, and, and, and that's right, it's not about, and this is where this message uh, flows from today. And uh, folks, I wonder, and for those of you that are driving, uh, or drivers, or those of you that are perhaps uh, uh, backseat drivers, uh, the, 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 the tendency sometimes is to look a little bit in the rear view mirror. But the problem is, when we look in the rear view mirror too much, we can miss what's coming up right in front of us, and we can end up straight through the windscreen into heaven if we're not careful. And we need to make sure, yes, we're aware of what's, what's behind us there, but we need to be focused on the road ahead. Uh, and really, folks, it's no good uh, spending time dwelling on yes. what you've already passed. Right. Yep. It's past. Amen. right? There's no point in dwelling on it. You're not going to get anything from it. Right. You need to be uh, moving on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, once I, I passed a speed camera and it flashed, I thought, it's a bit strange. I'm sure I was within the speed limit. I thought, and, and for the next five or ten minutes of the journey, I was thinking, mean, what's, what's this about? You know, uh, man, does it flash? Was I going fast enough for the laws? Am I going to get a ticket? What's the consequences of that? Insurance renewals come out. And all these thoughts are going through your mind. I thought, what does it matter? It's happened. Either it's flashed and you're going to get fined, or it's flashed and there's an error and you're not going to get fined. You can't actually change what's happened. It's happened. It's in the past. I needed to keep driving forwards, otherwise I'm never actually going to reach the destination that I've got. I believe that is what God wants to say to us today. Stop checking the rearview mirror, or stop focusing on the rearview mirror, and start focusing on what God has put in front of us, what God is bringing up in front of us. Not just in our own life, but around the world. You know, there is so much going on in society, there's so much going on in the world, even just this week. A general election was called. That is going to shape the course of this nation in some ways for the next few years. But folks, I want to tell you, I want to uh, encourage you for anyone that might be concerned about the result of the general election. It really doesn't matter who is in Downing Street. It doesn't matter who's in Hollywood because God is on the throne. Amen. Amen. And what does it say? It says that the government shall be upon his shoulders. Glory to God. Well, if we truly believe that, folks, it really doesn't matter who's in government. What we need to do is look to the uh, look up. Love Focus it. on the cross, yeah. rejoice, for our redemption right. draws near. I uh, folks, you say that um, in history, you know, who's heard that phrase, oh, you know, um, uh, history's all about learning from the past. Uh, by a show of hands, who actually thinks we learn from the past? A couple of people, okay? Sometimes we can. But the reality is, on a lot of occasions, we don't. Right? We might do sometimes in our lives, we, we take it on, we think we better not do that last time, there was different consequences. But actually, when you look at world events, it just keeps repeating itself. And the Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. The reason it keeps repeating itself is because those lessons are not learned. If those lessons were learned, then these sort of events still wouldn't keep going on and on. It just wouldn't happen. But sometimes people like to try and paint a bit of a rosy picture of history. Uh, it's called revisionism. I learned that when I was at university. Uh, and you read a book about one particular subject and you read another book about exactly the same subject and they both come to two different conclusions. How is this possible? Well, one was written a few years ago and now they need to sell another book so they just come up with a different view. It's called revisionism. But actually, sometimes there's a bit more of an nefarious agenda behind it and sometimes they actually uh, uh, set it so that they deliberately set out to come out with a different conclusion in order to paint a better picture of the past. 
in order to leave out the bits that are inconvenient in order to teach the next generation a certain way. Well, sometimes they make it even worse. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but whatever way, it's not accurate. So they do revisionism, they do it to push a certain agenda. You know, sometimes that happens in the church, doesn't it? You know, we, we, we see that um, across the church today. We see there as people uh, in acts of revisionism. They're trying to say, ah, oh, well, yeah, the word of God doesn't really say that. It doesn't really say. Actually, I think as a society we've moved on and we need to look at the word of God for that. No, actually what we need to do is we need to look at the word of God first and then see how we act. Yes. Not look at society and then say, how can we have find the scripture. If we, if, we, if we read it right to left instead of left to right, if we turn it upside down, it can actually say something totally different. Yeah, of course it will. Right? Turn to the first page, turn to the seventh page, turn to the sixteenth page, it'll probably tell you to run and jump off a cliff. You're going to go and run and jump off a cliff? That's the verse taken out of context. It's different words. It's not the actual word of God. We have to focus on what the actual word of God actually says and then follow it. Right? <coughs> not decide what we're going to do and then find a scripture that fits in with what we want to do. Because it's about God and His Word, not about us. Amen. And sometimes uh, it's not just revisionism. Sometimes people on, uh, focus on, on the past for uh, nostalgic reasons. Nostalgia is this idea uh, of that the, the past is always better than the present or the future. So we can uh, we look back, don't we? You know, and, and we remember things. Sometimes it's with fondness. You can think back to wonderful family events. Or you can think back to. Uh, uh, anecdotes of, of, of great fun and games and whatever else, but we tend to select the best bits and we ignore the worst bits, don't we? Because if there's hurt, if there's pain associated with those former events, we don't want to focus on those because we want to paint the, uh, the, 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 the best picture that we can, but it's not necessarily the full picture. And we can pretend sometimes uh, the opposite way. Sometimes we can pretend that the current uh, or the future is much better than the past. We're constantly progressing. Um, who's heard enough on it? Who you know, want to be progressive? You know, who wants to be regressive? Uh, and done to show the past as the bad. That's that revisionism. But often we're in an emperor's new clothes type situation where they present something as brand new and wonderful when in actual fact there is actually not even any clothes in the first place. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. It's all just empty, it's all just vacuous. Think now, we've got thousands of years, literally thousands of years of settled understanding that there was men and there's women and God creates us male or female. And then all of a sudden, in the last decade, a couple of decades, all of a sudden people start questioning that and just actually know. We, we, we are now enlightened. We now know the truth. Actually, there's a whole spectrum, and you can be this one on a Tuesday, and you can be that on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a chap uh, in a political party in the north uh, east or northwest of England a few years ago, and he wanted to stand to be the woman's officer of the local um, uh, constituency party. And they said, well, you can't do that. You're not a woman. He said, how dare you? He says, every second Wednesday on a month, I occasionally identify for a few hours as a woman. So because of their ridiculous gender policy, they had to allow him to stand for the woman's officer. And of course he, he, he won. Now he resigned the post because he was doing it just to prove a point. Right? But this is how ridiculous it is when we remove that simple basic truth that God created as male and female and try and paint it uh, in a particularly different way. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what it does is it leaves us trapped. It leaves us unable to move forward. You know the gospel message is not about what we've done. The gospel message is about what Christ has done for us. That's what the gospel message is about. So because of what Christ has done for us, we can now look forward to a future of hope, of prosperity, of the fullness of life, new life in Christ. So if you've got your Bible with you, uh, please turn to Isaiah uh, 43. Um, I don't know if the words are going to come up on the screen. We're going to um, break in a little bit here midway through the chapter. We're just going to read a few short verses here this morning. Isaiah 43, and we're going to break in at verse 18. Amen. So Isaiah 43 and verse 18 says, Remember not, clear instruction, yeah? Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I have formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. That's it. A few short verses there, folks. 
So what's the context of this passage? Well, this wider um, part, Isaiah is a prophet, he's speaking here to the people of Israel. The whole of chapter 43 is about God's redemptive plan for his people. It's about uh, words that were spoken to Israel, to, uh, to the people of Israel originally through Isaiah, remembering God's promises, looking back, remembering those wonderful promises, how he had delivered them. He says, fear not, in verse 1, he says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Right, if you passed your way back to the beginning of that chapter, we didn't read that first. It says, fear not for I have redeemed you. It starts this, that, that confirmation, that affirmation, that, that reassurance. I have redeemed you. I've already redeemed you. Don't worry. No need to panic here. God knows us by name. There is no need to hark back and dwell for them on that slavery in those days of Egypt because they're no longer in slavery. It's a thing of the past. It's finished. It's done. It's over. It's behind. So there's no need to dwell on it. There's no need to try and live the past now because the past has gone. It's got nothing to do uh, with uh, the, the current or the future. And it's a reminder here of God's faithfulness, this chapter, of his future plans for Israel. God will not just uh, uh, deliver his people as he has done, but he'll continue to deliver his people. And he'll be with us continually. You see that there in verse 2 and 3, and reminds people that he is Lord, he is King, he is Saviour. Now, folks, I want to tell you this morning that the past, if you allow it to, will hold you back. It will, it will consume you if you allow it to, particularly if the past is uh, not a particularly great past for whatever reason. Uh, and and, and God, 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 God knows that this is the case. So what does he do straight away here? He says, remember not the former things. He tells us, he instructs us, move forward, don't move backwards. Folks, let the past be a story of your redemption. Amen. The pit from where God took you, not the pit that defines you now. Psalm 40 and verse 2, it says that he will take us from the miry clay and he will set our feet upon the rock. I don't know if anyone has ever stood on slightly squelchy ground, but you feel a bit uneasy, right? If anyone ever walked on the beach when the tide's just gone out and the sand is, it looks dry, and you walk on it, all of a sudden you find yourself sinking a little bit. Gosh, compared to nice, firm, solid, dry rock, a bit more stable, isn't it? God wants to place our feet upon the rock. He wants to pick us out of that miry clay, get us out of the pit. <clears throat> so what does it do, trying to live in the past? What does it achieve? What's well, already happened, whether it's good or bad, it simply can't be changed. You might want it to change, but it cannot be changed. It's the past that's happened. But folks, we can change the future. We can decide to say, actually, God, what has gone before is before, and now I'm focused on what you've got for me going forward. We can choose to allow God to come into our hearts and to change us from the inside out. And there's many people sitting here that can be testimony of that this morning. But the devil, you see, we're engaged in a spiritual warfare here because the devil wants to keep us bound in the past. He wants to keep us bound, convince us that our past defines the present and the future. Folks, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Yes. Do not ever let anyone try and tell you, you can't do that because that's where you were. You had that decry of childhood. You had that abuse. You had that illness. You had that sickness. You had that depression. You had that anxiety. That defines who you are now. That defines who you're going to be in the future. It's not the case, folks. It doesn't have to be the case because God is greater than every single one of those circumstances. He holds the power to heal. He holds the power to deliver. And he wants to see and deliver you here today, this morning. Everyone, folks, has a past. It's not about denying that there is a past. That would be stupid itself. Everyone has a past. But God says, walk in new life. Amen. Versus a devil that wants to claim that your life always just has to be this rubbish. Always just have to move along the street with your little blue carrier <laughs> back thinking this is as good as it gets. On a southbound train to nowhere going nowhere fast. Doesn't have to be like that. God says your life can be better when you surrender to Christ and you deal with that sin in the form of asking for forgiveness. That's what that redemptive message of the cross is all about. But the devil, you see, this is where the deception comes in. The devil says life is actually better when you bring in more sin. He, said he dresses it up in things that are desirable. Right? So go out to the pubs and clubs. Find somebody you quite like the look of or fall, and then roll into bed with them. It's just a bit of fun, isn't it? Just a bit of harmless fun. No. He dresses it up as things that are right, when in actual fact they're fundamentally wrong. And we have to be on the guard against these things because they are the things that will create a past that will keep us trapped in the past. You know, there's a, a friend of mine down south 
goes by the name of Simon Pinchbeck, and he is a, a, a chap, um, well, most people make me look tall, but he makes me look particularly small. Um, <laughs> I, he's at least double my height and, and nearly double my width as well, but the, which is also quite something to achieve. But the, uh, he used to be a, 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 a police officer, um, and what he did in the 1980s <laughs> was he was a police officer um, at... Um, um, I'm going to say a square word, it's called Arsenal Football Club. Um, uh, and uh, that was back in the heyday of um, all the football hooliganism, and, and, and the police would have constant running battles. And what ended up happening was he got involved with the wrong crowd, and he slipped into the, and then when he left the police, he ended up getting involved with the underworld criminal world, money laundering, and all sorts of things. Uh, and it was great, he was getting loads of money, it was all wonderful, and it all came crashing down when he was stitched up on one occasion, he was left with absolutely nothing. By this stage, his wife had left him, his children didn't want to speak to him, he had nothing. He thought he had everything and he had nothing. Mm -hmm. And then on the way to court for a prosecution, he had an encounter with Jesus through someone else at a set of traffic lights. Oh. And God delivered him miraculously and he was never found guilty and, he, and now that's his testimony. He goes with the tagline of copper to criminal to Christian. CCC. Okay? And a lot of people always say, ah, you know, it's time now. I, I just grew up in a Christian family, and I just had such a nice, small, you know, genteel upbringing. I'd love to have a story like yours, a powerful story. Yeah, it's a powerful story, and Simon always turns around and says, no, you wouldn't. Yeah. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't want to go through what I went through. Praise God for what he's done in my life, and praise God that he can use that testimony to help other people. But no, you wouldn't want to go through that. No. So if you're sitting there this morning, and you've had a, a, a perfectly reasonable life, and you've had quite a settled upbringing, praise God. Praise God for that. But it's, a, it's a spiritual battle. We won't dwell on Ephesians 6. We won't know more about spiritual warfare. I did a whole series on that um, uh, over um, start in October last year. It's there on the YouTube channel. You can have a look at that. Galatians 5 and 16. He says, walk in the spirit and you won't sin. Because we need to decide. It's an active decision that we make. We need to decide to walk in the spirit. We need to decide to focus on Jesus. A focus on the future. And God will lift us up. He will put our feet on the rock. So in verse 18 here, we see this clear instruction to forget the past, to move on, to don't dwell on it. There's nothing gained in spending time thinking about it. But then God doesn't just stop there. He goes even further by saying, don't even consider it. So it's not that he says, actually, just don't think about the past. Don't let it define who you are. He says, don't even consider it. Don't even give it one iota of a thought. Don't even let it come in at all. He's very really clear there. You ever seen a parent and the, the child, you know, trying to push the boundaries? I pushed the boundaries once. My parents are here, you can ask them, they'll tell you, maybe it was twice. But the child is looking at the parent and you, you know, the child sort of, you know, if the parent says, don't go over that line, if you don't go over that line, it's lying here. Don't, and the child will sit there and they'll look at the parent and they'll sort of, focus. And you know, he tries to move forward, doesn't he? And the parents say, like, don't! Go over that line. Don't even think about it. Right? That's what God is sort of saying to us. He's, sort of, he's established that. He says, that's the past is gone. Don't even think about it. Don't even consider crossing it. Don't even push yourself into that situation. Just focus on the newness of life that I have for you, for all the plans and purposes. Verse 19, it says, God is doing a new thing. We need to be focused on this new thing. What is the new thing that God is doing? We, we have a very simple uh, vision here at Eastgate. It's called to see the glory of God. That's it. You'll find some churches that have got 45-page dossiers on their church vision. Right? We've got, what's that, four words or something. Right? Because that's really as simple as it is. We just want to see a move of God. We want to see the glory of God. We want to see the captives set free. We want to see sinners forgiven. We want to see the, the sick healed. We want to see the lame walking. We want to see the depressed smiling. We want to see the anxious walking in faith, not fear. And so on and so forth. It's really rather simple. We don't need ecclesiastical structure and religious dogma to get in the way between us and what God wants to do in our lives. God, it says here, is making a way in the desert. He's, he's making streams in the desert. He, there is no source of water there, but God will make a stream. Why? Because he's the God of the impossible. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're sitting there today and you're facing what seems to be an insurmountable situation. Maybe you're sitting there facing an impossible situation in your life. Well, God says, I am the God who makes water in the desert. Amen. I am the God who makes a stream that flows where there wasn't even a crevice for a stream to flow. Yes. <clears throat> you see, when Christ 
died and rose again, he didn't just open the door for us to come back into partnership with God. He created a door. There wasn't even a door. There just was a wall. And this wall that was built up because of sin, everything that we've done, everything that we did that rebelled against God, it built up this terrible wall that meant that we couldn't cross over it. He created a door, he opened the door, and he says, anyone that knocks, I'll open the door and I'll come in. <clears throat> and maybe you're sitting there, and maybe, maybe the world, maybe your family, maybe your friends, maybe even your colleagues at work, they've written you off, maybe, maybe you've gone for a promotion and a job and you haven't got it, and people sitting there, hey, 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 I told you, you're never any good for it. Maybe you're battling various things and your family member says, yeah, well, you know, you always were a bit of a cripple. You know? And we can laugh sometimes about these things, but folks, there's power in these words that are spoken over us. I want to tell you, God never did write you off. God never wrote you off and God loves you so much that he came and stepped out of the tranquility and perfectness of heaven to come to the mess of this world to clean us up. He has a plan. He has plans, as Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, he has plans not to harm, but to prosper us. And that means in every single area of our life. And he wants us focused on what he's going to do, not what has already happened. You see, plans are things of the future, God's things. Reports are things of the past, the devil's reminders. What do you want? Do you want the devil's reminders in your life, or do you want God's plans in your life? I know what I want. Now we've got here Alan. Alan, would you come and, 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 and step forward, please? If, if you could. I did speak to him before, so it's not a total shock. <laughs> now, what do we see here? <laughs> the man that's doubled my height. Like these people. But what we see here is a man who should not be standing here. In the natural realm, he should not be standing here. Right? How many years ago you climbed up that pile of money? 13, 14 years ago, right? 13, 14 years ago, Alan tried to take his life. He tried to reach such a low end. He climbed up a pylon and he, and he clamped onto the electric uh, wires and several hundred thousand volts goes right through his body. He shouldn't even be alive. Right? He was in a coma and they said he would never wake up. He woke up. He said he, they were lying in a bed and he said he'd never walk again. And he's walking, he just saw him walk to the front. Right? They said he would never talk again. He can't stop talking. <laughs> right? And I want to tell you something, folks. A few weeks ago, we were out in Paisley and in the evangelism team on a Wednesday afternoon. And Alan was out there going great guns and he's standing there and he's talking to someone. And there's this guy that was just caught up in this process of condemnation. I'm not worth it. I'm not worthy. Blah, blah, blah. And, and Alan was able to stand there and say, you know what? I was exactly where you are today just four months ago. God. See, that's the power of Christ. What we see here, folks, in Alan, is the power of Amen. the Holy Spirit Amen. working and operating our lives together. Praise God. Praise God. But God's not done with Alan. And we know that because he's protected his life on several occasions. God's not done with Alan because even when he reached the low air, God came in and he picked him up out of the miry clay he was in and he set his feet upon the rock. And he stands here before us today as a living testimony and proof of the power of God of what he's made. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You see, when the world broke Alan off, and when the devil was whispering to him and trying to, trying to keep him down, when the devil had him bound in condemnation, God said, Romans 8.1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. When the world broke Alan off, God was just getting started. And every single day is a miracle. It's amazing. It's amazing what we see God doing in his life just now. The world kept telling him he wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. He's not good enough. But God was just getting started. And in the same way, God came running after each and every one of us. He did it. All for you because he loves you and because he has a plan and he has a purpose for you. And so it says here also in verse 19, do you not perceive it? Do you not perceive it? Do you not see this new thing that God is doing? God is asking if we see the new thing he's about to do or are we still trapped in the past defeats and failures? 
we have a choice to make. We can either choose to see this new thing that God's doing, or we can choose to ignore it. And then we move to verse 20, going all about giving God his rightful place. It's interesting here that it says even the animals will honor God. And yet we're created above animals. We're created to look after animals and to be stewards of animals. Animals are created with value, but they're not created in God's image. That's the difference between us. And God sustains those animals. And therefore, how much more should we worship God because he's the sustainer of us? If even an animal can give honor to God because God provides the food and the water and the drink and, the, uh, and everything he needs to keep the animal nourished, then God provides even more for us and therefore we should give him even more glory and grace. The sustaining there is, is a supernatural. It, God regularly defies the natural realm, why? Right? Because he operates outside of it. And so often we try to bring it all back down and rationalize things and try to understand it in our own little box of things. Folks start thinking outside of the box, literally. That's where God operates. Verse 21, it all comes back to God's glory. God created us so he does all these things for us. God created us to be worshippers of him. So we are meant to praise him. And we are created for God. Did you know that? We created for God. And, then, and we know that's true because the devil constantly tries to make it about us. Uh, just live your best life now and go to the gym and be obsessed about it. I sat on the train the other day. The one day I forgot my earphones. I quite like the earphones. Noise cancelling. You don't have to hear some of the chat that goes on. Sometimes you want to, but a lot of the time you don't. And I forgot my earphones. And there's this chap sitting opposite me. Honestly, for the whole 40-minute journey, he was on the phone to a succession of people complaining about how tired he is because he's been up since half past five and he was in the gym. He's worked as many as four days this week. Very tired, very tired. Four days a week. Too much, too much. And then the next phone call, Joe, sure, would you believe it? I'm really tired. I'm just absolutely shattered and all this gym work. But so pleased, you know, such a transformation. And I sat there and I thought, I'm vain. I'm sad. Because he's just living for this. Living for this vain nonsense right in front of him. And actually, what is the greater picture here? What is the greater picture? The greater picture is a lost soul in need of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The devil tries to make it about us. We need to flip it back to how it was always intended to be. It's about God and God alone. So how are you defined? Where is your identity? Are you defined by past failures? Everyone's made some mistakes along the lines. Some people have faced some defeat at some point. Various people have faced pain at different points in their life. Are you, are you defined by those defeats? Are you defined by that pain? Are you defined by those mistakes? Or are you defined by how God defines you? Fearfully and wonderfully made. A child of God. Every single hair on your head. Some have got more than others. <laughs> numbered. But even those who don't have any hair visible are still the products underneath the skin. But God has them numbered as well. Praise God. So when we look at different things such as sickness, maybe you're here today and you're sick, you've got a, you've, you, you, you've got a, a long-term issue or you've got a shorter-term issue, do not be defined by it. Don't allow yourself to, yeah, to, to, to name it, don't own the sickness. You know, it really frustrates me the amount of people that go around saying, oh, you know, it's been a struggle of a week, you know, my, my depression has really got the better of me this week. It's not your depression. It's not about denying the reality that there might be depression there. Absolutely, there may well be. But it doesn't belong to you because it comes from hell. Amen. It's not God's creation. And the minute we attach that word, my, we're personalizing it. Right? I've said it before and I'll say it again. I've got arthritis in my hip. It's a long-term issue, right? Am I going to be healed one day? Yes, absolutely. I fundamentally believe that. Don't know when. That's in God's timing. But I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on the fact that there is arthritis there. But I don't say my arthritis because it's not mine. It's my hip because it belongs to me. God created me with it. But it's not my arthritis. God didn't create the arthritis. God allowed it to be there for whatever purpose. But the devil put it. The devil created these things. So sickness is not part of you. It's not meant to be there. So reject it. Declare it out. It's squatting in your body. Everyone I heard of squatters, you know, they're not meant to be there. They don't actually have a right to be there, but they often sit there forevermore, don't they? Sickness can sit there forevermore if you don't start calling it out. Because you don't start. And it, it, it might not just go away straight away, but you don't allow it to become part of you. You don't allow it to define you. 
The same goes with mental illness, depression, anxiety, the amount of people that are plagued by these things is unbelievable. It's through the roof. Why? Because we've got a world, a media, a whole industry of psychiatrists that tell you it's just a thing to manage and cope with and it's just a spectrum and everyone's sick and everyone's ill and everyone's on this spectrum and some people just find better coping strategies than others. Folks, it is possible to move past these things. Yes. Yeah. It is possible to move past these things. Put your hand up if you've ever had a paper cut on your finger. Ever had a paper cut? A few people, a few of you very fortunate to have never had a paper cut. Why on earth, by the way, is it one of the most painful things you can ever experience in life? I've been through serious major surgery in my life. Nothing, nothing comes close to a minor paper cut uh, on the tip of the finger. It's unbelievable. Isn't it? But, but of those who put their hand up, who has a paper cup today? Oh, there's zero hands up. That's quite remarkable because I just thought it was a spectrum of paper cups and it was all just about coping it with it and managing it. Do you see how the devil twists the language when it comes to these different issues that he tries to make it something that you just need to cope with? No, actually you can see healing, you can see deliverance, you can see restoration. There are brighter days you can move forward through the power of God. It can be a thing of the past. And what about spirit of poverty? Some people, oh, well, you know, I'll just never make it and I'll always lack and blah, blah, blah. Folks, without even getting carried away with a prosperity gospel, the Bible I read says, Give and it will be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together and running over. He says elsewhere that you never lack. Focus on God. Get things in order in your life and you'll never lack. I have never lacked. There's been times in my life where I've sat and I thought, I've got a bill to pay tomorrow about the money in the account. I've never not been able to pay the bill. Mm -hmm. God provides. Yes. Never lack. That doesn't mean you're going to be sitting there with a private jet and a Lamborghini or two on the driveway, as nice as that might be if you're into that sort of thing. But it does mean that God will never leave you lacking. Because he promises there in his word to never leave us and never forsake us. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've been a victim of abuse, spiritual, physical, sexual abuse in the past. These things can have a tremendous hold over us. They can hold us back, they can put us down, they can hold us back from really being able to move forward in different areas of life. You know, I'm going to tell you this morning, you can be released from the grip that that abuse has had on you. It starts with choosing to forgive the abuser. And I don't say that lightly because I know it's not an easy thing to do. But it starts with choosing to forgive the abuser. And it will release you. You know, we've done Freedom in Christ in this church on a few occasions and we'll do it again. And Freedom in Christ focuses very heavily on forgiveness. Why? Because forgiveness is at the root of everything that we do. If you're not prepared to forgive someone for what they did to you, how on earth can you expect God to forgive you for your sin? <coughs> he will, because he's gracious and he loves you. But there's work that we need to do on our part as well. So folks, stop saying I can't and start saying and start choosing to believe that you can. Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Our dear brother Brian here, you know, there was a time in his life where things were not particularly uh, good and he was, and he was stuck in, in a bit of a rut. And, and there he was uh, selling a big issue out on the streets and when COVID came along, of course, you know, it was very difficult to do those sort of things. But what did he do? He focused on what he could do. He focused on, and he used this entrepreneurial spirit that God has placed within him and he, and he tried different methods so that when one thing got shut down, he said, that's okay, I'll just move on to the next place, I'll just move and do a slightly different thing. And he, and, and he pushed through. You know what Brian's doing today? He's got his own business. Amen. And God is going to prosper that business. Because he chose, when the world tried to shut things down, when the system came against him, he chose to say, I'm not having any of that nonsense. I'm going to do what God's got for me. Amen. When the world broke Brian off, when people around him broke him off, God was just getting started. Amen, Brian. Amen. Amen. Thank you. He chose to focus on the future. So there we have Alan and we have Brian sitting. And there's others here this morning. Brian and Alan, just two examples of people who refused to allow the past to define them, chose to believe that God has a future for them and they both been set free and delivered. Amen. If you bound in the past today, God wants to set you free. Yeah. So that you can walk out the same door that you came in this morning in freedom. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. The devil wants to tell you you can never get past it, that it will always plague you, but God tells you that you can overcome. Why? Because Christ has already overcome. Yeah. Romans 
Romans 6, for more on that, there's a future message there. Let sin be a thing of the past that we never look back at. But then we see this thing progressivism, don't we? You know, claim that it's all about moving forward, that it's about doing things better. You know, we hear this term a lot in the media, don't we? You know, if it's a lie from the devil, there's nothing progressive about progressivism. It's utterly regressive. Why? Well, because it's actually all about moving backwards in sin. All about moving backwards in sin. Staying in the pit, the grave of sin, being bound by nonsense ideas like abortion liberates a woman, that it's okay to sleep around with whoever, whenever, a little lie here and a little lie there, and that's just fine. A man can become a woman, it's okay to usurp God's pattern for life, it's okay to God to ignore the hierarchy that God has ordained in the church and in the, and in the home. We need to move past these ideas as what society tells us, the media pushes all these agendas, films, TV programs, every single panel, every single angle, pushing all of these ridiculous agendas. This whole thing can be summed up in this whole idea of if it feels good, then it is good. There's another lie, folks. Because when it feels good, that's when feelings have taken over. And when feelings take over, your head is not operating. And when your head is not operating, you might as well be dead. God gave us a head for a purpose, and then it's not using it. Because God also created us with emotions, but he didn't create us to be emotionally driven. He created us to be sensitive to the emotions, yes, but to be driven by the power of his Holy Spirit working for us. There are some things that are objectively good and bad. And I want to tell you that circumstances don't change that. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just more convenient. It might be more convenient in the moment, but the greater and the bigger picture of things is that those things are either good or bad. Circumstances are never going to change it. When it becomes all about how we feel, we start to make things subjective. We start to relativize things. And it's a dangerous territory, as I said, because those emotions are ruling. So this name progressive is it's a, it's a contradiction and it's a deception. There's no progression. It's all regressive. It leads you backwards. And ultimately, God flips it on its head and he tells us to put on the new man. Ephesians 4, 22, 24. It says, take up the gift of new life. Embrace the Holy Spirit. Don't think on those things before. <coughs> So we see these three things in this passage here, in these few short verses. We see that God says, forget the past, don't even consider it. You were delivered. Not going to be, not are. You were delivered. It's already happened. That deliverance has already come. Secondly, God is doing a new thing. Thirdly, that we need to focus on the future. God will continue to deliver and he will give victory. God is calling us to focus on the future and the things that he has for us. There's nothing gained in looking and focusing on the past. So we need to choose today. It's a choice that we need to make. That's the wonderful thing with God. He doesn't force anything on us. He, he allows us to decide on our own terms and say, yeah, yeah. actually I want to choose you today. Yeah. Don't let the devil keep you trapped in the past. If Jesus, he came and he died and he was raised to life so that we can have new life. Yes. The old is gone, the new has come. We don't focus on the former because it's gone. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. But we need to let that part of the past, the part of a testimony of the former life. I spoke there about Simon Pinchbeck of his story. He doesn't revel in those things that he got up to. He uses them as testimony of the power of God working in his life. So let those things of the past be testimony of the former life, not evidence of the life that you're currently living. Those Curses of the past, those generational curses, those Masonic rituals. Oh, you know, there was a great great grandfather that had his big toes dipped in water, and ever since then I've been unable to do. Let's let's break the power of those yeah. those curses. Mm. Let's break the power of them in Jesus' name and move on. Because yeah. it's far too long that people have been operating in the past, operating according to those curses, operating according to those messages that have been passed down the generations. You're not living your great-grandfather's life. You're living your life. Yes. But the devil will try and make it that you're not living your life. He tries to keep you in the tomb of existence, believing that things can't be any better. Jesus is calling you out of the tomb and into life of abundance. He's already made the price. He's already made the way for us to be reconciled to God. And here's, here's the key difference, folks. Religion looks at what we need to do to get somewhere. Christianity, on the other hand, it looks at what's already been done so that we can embrace a future without fear and walk in freedom of Christ. Ultimately, folks, religion holds us in the past. It keeps us bound and locked in chains where Jesus sets us free and gives peace, hope, and new life. 
But the devil will, if we allow him to, keep us in that darkened tomb. Whilst he claims that we're living in the freedom of sexual sin or addiction, we're actually bound by it. It's actually holding us back. Yes. Folks, tombs are for the dead. Yes. Amen. Now, I'm looking out here just now, and everyone looks pretty alive to me. <laughs> so let's get out of the tomb and start living the life that God's given for us. <laughs> Jesus came, Luke 4, 18, when Jesus reads the scroll in the, in the temple, quoting Isaiah 61. He came to set the captives free, to release the prisoners. <laughs> Physically, yes, but also what he's particularly referring to there is his forgiveness. He came to set people free. I'm going to ask you today, are you existing or are you living? Because there's a difference. God says in John 10.10 10, that the devil, whilst he comes to kill, steal and destroy, Jesus comes to give life, but it doesn't just stop there. He says life in all abundance. It's amazing. The devil will try and keep you bound, try and keep you merely existing, just plodding through life, struggling to get through each day. It's a great success. We managed to reach 4 p.m. Amazing. He'll just sap the life out of you. Versus Jesus, who said, allow me to come and change you from the inside out. Allow me to come and transform you, that you will start to walk in all the abundance of life, that you will stop wallowing in the past, that you will start embracing the plans and the purposes that I have, plans to prosper and not to harm. And it may seem right now you're sitting there going, oh, but it's impossible for me to move past the past. Yes, it may well be impossible for you, but it's not impossible for God, for with God all things are possible. At one point the Israelites resigned to permanent slavery in Egypt, but God, he had a plan. And at one point Jonah was consigned to the belly of a whale, but God still had a plan. And at one point the disciples were even resigned to Jesus being dead. But God had a plan and he was just getting started. When Alan was lying in hospital asleep in a deep coma, God had a plan and he was just getting started. When Brian was out on the street selling the big issue, God had a plan and he was just getting started. And wherever you're sitting today, God has got a plan for you today. He's got plans to prosper and not to harm. He wants to set you free. He wants to heal you. He wants to raise you up. He wants to bring you into the abundance of the fullness of everything that he has for you. He promises to make a way in the desert. Isn't that amazing? We serve a God that can part water and make dry land out of water, and he can make water out of dry land. We might spend a while trying to conduct that experiment. Don't bother. It's all God's power. At one point in your life, it seemed like you were going nowhere fast, but God has got a plan for your life. He wants to release us from the past. He wants us to embrace what he's got for us. God wants to release you from the curses of the past. I want to ask you a question this morning, and this matters a lot. He says, do you want to move forward? Do you want to move on? Because that's the starting point. The starting point is deciding, yes. I want to move past. Yes, I want to live a better life. Yes, I want to come out of the tomb of existence and embrace the life of abundance that Christ offers me. Well, if the answer is yes, I want to move on, then the second question is, are you prepared for the Holy Spirit to come in and release you from the past? Do you want to, and are you prepared for God to move in your life this morning? Let us take a moment to consider that amongst us. Father, we thank you that you came to give us life and give us life in all abundance. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came not that we could be staying in the tomb, but we came, Lord Jesus, just as you came out of the tomb. You came so that we can live a life outside of the tomb. We can be alive because of what you did for us. And Father, I want to pray, Lord Jesus, for anyone here this morning who is suffering and struggling and who has been beaten down by what the world has said to them, by what friends, colleagues, neighbours and others have said to them down the years, maybe even teachers all those years ago in school, whatever has been said to them that's held them back, that has caused them to focus on the past, has kept them bound in the curse of the past, where generational curses have not been broken. <coughs> Lord, I pray that we bring these to the fore, that they could be dealt with, that the power of these things will be broken, that people will be able to move forward in the newness and the abundance of life in you. 
Lord, we thank you that you are the God of the impossible, that you make the impossible possible because there is no limitation to your power. There is no limitation to you, Jesus. And so, God, we thank you, Lord, that you are not just some kind of distant God. You're not just some kind of distant being that we need to jump through any kind of metaphorical hoop to get to. Lord, we thank you that you came to us. You came to us to die and to be raised to life so that that bridge, that, that gap could be bridged back to you. If only we would just say yes, help me in. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.